Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we were asking the most important question first, which is what is the KCNA? So the KCNA stands for Kubernetes and Cloud Native Associate, and it's the entry level uh, CNCF certification. So CNCF is the organization that is issuing this certification. Um, and so this certification is gonna teach you the landscape of cloud native technologies, a close look at the core Kubernetes components, a quick look at the vast amount of CNCF projects and cloud native tooling, a general overview of security deployment and monitoring, the structure and governance of CNCF and the community around cloud native. So the course code here is the KCNA. Um, and it doesn't have like versioning like other certifications like AWS or Azure, where Azure would be something like the AZ300 and then go 301, 302 for the next versions. Um, and AWS would have like CO1, CO2, CO3 on the end. And so they just don't do this. The only way you'd know what version you're on is you'd have to go to an obscure GitHub page and see the curriculum version there. But we are on version one uh, for this. So consider this version one KCNA. Um, and Kubernetes is one of the hottest technologies being adopted in the world. It's in the top four there with AWS Azure, then Kubernetes and Terraform. So definitely worth it to add to your journey. So uh, who is a certification for? Well, considering taking the KCNA, if you are new to cloud native and Kubernetes and need to learn the fundamentals, you are an executive management or sales level and need to acquire strategic information about cloud native for adoption or migration. You are a senior cloud engineer or solutions architect looking to quickly add Kubernetes and cloud native to your skill set. And so notice that we have um, three asterisks up here. And the reason why is that um, unlike other fundamental certifications, this one feels like it was made by engineers, people that want to use Kubernetes as opposed to people that um, are from the business perspective. And so it's missing things like uh, adoption frameworks, uh, cost, like total cost of ownership, shared responsibility model, um, uh, migration paths. So for that, I, you know, I kind of fill in the gaps best I can, but it's not on the exam and it's kind of a misstep of a fundamental certification in my sense. Uh, so if you are in the executive management sales level and expecting to have a lot of that stuff, you're gonna be a bit disappointed to find out it's a lot more code than you'd like. Um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't take it. it just means that uh, you might not want to sit the exam because it might not be worth it because you'll fail because you're not really trying to become someone who can code in Kubernetes as opposed to just understanding it from a managerial perspective. But uh, for anyone that is like wants to be an engineer, uh, like a Kubernetes engineer, this is the right course for you. So the uh, KCNA is a difficult uh, exam for entry level. And you're going to need both hands-on and broad conceptual knowledge of the Kubernetes cloud native uh, projects. And I really stress hands-on. Now, this certification is multiple choice, so technically you could do without hands-on. But uh, to contextualize a lot of the questions or even to go to the next step of certifications, you're going to be in bad shape if you don't do hands-on. So for technical implementation roles like Kubernetes engineer or cloud native engineer, uh, this might not be enough uh, to get you that role. Um, if you already have prior experience, like you work a tech job, then yes, it is a good addition uh, and it can get you a role as a Kubernetes engineer. But if you're just like from starting from zero, then you might need a bit more work or go further down the, uh, road, uh, the roadmap there. So when you complete the certification, you'll be able to deploy a simple application into a Kubernetes cluster, understand uh, various Kubernetes components, but not enough to deploy a production ready application. So really missing those complex production setups, like for deployment, uh, security, uh, like working with a lot of different microservices and things like that. So let's take a look at our roadmap here. So we have suggested prerequis uh, prerequisites and Kubernetes track. Now, the thing is, I never, ever, ever, ever at a fundamental have to recommend suggested prerequisites. So this should tell you something about the difficulty of this exam. And you really just say, I have everything inclusive. You can go ahead from uh, uh, day zero and, and get into the cloud, right? But this one, uh, you're gonna need some Linux knowledge, you're gonna need some uh, ne uh, Linux networking knowledge, IT networking, cloud networking, whatever, uh, or a associate level cloud certification. If you can pass one of these, then you probably have the knowledge for the ones above there. I'm not saying go sit all of these, I'm just making suggestions of one of those categories here. Um, and then from there, I, then I would recommend to proceed to the KCNA. You can do the KCNA without doing all this prerequisite stuff, you just uh, might be a bit more confused than expected, okay? Um, and so after that, I would generally recommend the CKD because once you are done the, the fundamental knowledge of being able to work with clusters, uh, usually people want to deploy them. And so, uh, you know, there is the 
KCA, which I recommend next, but that one, the KCA administrator, is more about like managing nodes and self-deployment of clusters where the KCAD feels more practical. And it says application developer, but it's really not, uh, you're not building out apps per se, it's more like stuff around them. Uh, and so since a lot of providers are managed, this feels like a better fit um, for, for most people. After that, you can go with the CKS, uh, but if you really want to call yourself a Kubernetes engineer, you're going to have to at least make it to this stage, right? Either one or the other, uh, depending on, or both, uh, depending on what you do. Um, but generally, like, once you once you go beyond the KCNA, all these things are pretty much like the KCAD, C CKS, and CKA. They're all the same kind of difficulty, just in different kind of areas. And honestly, I feel like they should have just been like a pro cert. You should have just studied them all together. Um, because it's like not that much work to do the extra ones. The key difference here is that this here is multiple choice. These are all hands-on. And so that's why I say that I have to spend extra time with you doing hands-on because I'm preparing you for the next level. If you don't do those, you're gonna really struggle the next step. So doing those hands-on is very important. How long should you study to pass? Well, um, for this beginner, I have 50 hours at one end. So if you've never done Linux networking or cloud, uh, you're going to be doing it outside of this course, but trying to find to fill that knowledge. If you've never written uh, code or held a technical role, it's just going to be a lot of work. For the experienced, if you have worked with a CSP like AWS Azure GCP, Linux and Linux networking, you're looking at 20 hours. Um, that's still a little bit long. Normally, I would suggest like 14 hours. And the course is like the video content is not even, um, uh, you know, like 20 hours, but the thing is, is that you're going to have to spend a lot of time doing hands-on labs and you have to factor in the time that you're going to be doing practice exams. So it is, of course, longer there. The average time, I would say, is 30 hours. Um, so 50% le le lectures and labs, 50% practice exams. And we're recommending uh, a couple hours a day for three weeks out. Uh, normally, like I would say two weeks for fundamentals, sometimes even a week. Like in the old, my old CLF CO1, uh, it was Certified Cloud Practitioner. Uh, we would recommend like, literally like book it the next week. Um, but the, this one is really hard. So you're gonna need a bit more uh, time to get there, okay? What does it take to pass the exam? Well, watch the uh, video lectures, memorize key information, do hands-on lab. This one is especially important. We call them follow-alongs, but um, uh, strongly, 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 strongly recommend doing these within your own account. And when I say that, like we're gonna be doing it all in AWS on cloud nine. And uh, there are sandboxes out there and they are an option if you do not have money and, and you do not have a credit card. But um, if you can, please do them in Cloud9 and follow along it uh, because if you do sandboxes, they're abstracting away a lot of things that you that could go wrong. And that's the parts that you, you need to actually uh, become a, a Kubernetes engineer, uh, dealing with those hard bits. So you are cheating yourself if you use sandboxes, but I understand why people want to use them because they're just... They want to uh, kind of have that, okay? So do paid online practice exams, the same with the real exam. The great thing is that um, uh, if you sign up an exam pro today, no credit card require KCNA, I got a full free practice exam for you. Extremely generous. Uh, and if you want, you can definitely sign up with a credit card to get access to the rest of the practice exams, all the rest of the Larry content, cheat sheets and more. Would greatly appreciate it so we can produce more free video content. Our content outline is out of five domains. So each has its own weighting and that's gonna determine how many questions. So we have fundamentals, uh, container orchestration, container native architecture, cloud native observability, cloud native application delivery. You'll notice some say like between X, uh, like 27, 20 questions. It's because if you do the math, you end up with like a decimal point for how many questions there are. So that means that you could have one additional or one less on certain ones there. Um, and most of it's fundamentals. So fundamentals is strongly focused on Kubernetes components. So where do you take this exam? Well, either in person at a test center or online for the convenience of your own home. Um, uh, for these, which is through the Linux Foundation, uh, I know it's CNCF, but like CNCF is part of the Linux Foundation. And so you'll go to Linux Foundation to sign up for this. And this uses the PSI network of test centers and online proctor exam system. So it'll look like Linux Foundation has their own thing, but then you'll end up on PSI. Um, and if you can, please take it in person because uh, online it's so stressful, you know, like your dog could bark, your kid could cough, someone could knock on the door, um, you know, the internet could go out and the check-in process is always painful. It's not PSI, it's any of them. 
And, uh, you know, if you want to just be less stressed, I would uh, suggest in person if that is an option for you. If it's not, then you have to do online. Um, I think PSI, they're the more strict ones. So Pearson View, uh, I prefer Pearson View, um, but PSI, like you can't even have anything on the desk. So like for me, I like to have a, a box on the desk in the middle of the room to prop up my laptop. They don't even let you have that box to prop up it up. So uh, just make sure you're really comfortable and you have a table that's a good eye level for that. If you don't know what a proctor is, it's a supervisor or person who monitors students during an examination. So let's take a look here at grading. So the passing score would be about 75%. I say about or around because it might use scaled scoring. Usually the uh, uh, exam takers will point out that out. That just means that um, the system isn't exact. And so it's possible to fail with a 75%. Um, and since it's P on PSI, I just assume that it's following like what all the other providers are doing. So always aim for, you know, more at least 1% above there, but you probably can pass at 75% always aim 10% above. There are 60 questions. And as far as I can tell, there are no unscored questions. Unscored questions happen on exams for many reasons. Uh, so like eight of us has like 15, I think it's like 15 or 10. No, it's 10. I think it's 10 unscored questions. And um, you know, they're just oddball questions to help detect cheaters to see if they want to introduce new questions, things like that. They don't do this here with the KCNA. So every question is scored. And there are some oddball ones in there. So that's why I thought there would have been some, but there's not. You have about 15 questions you can get wrong. Um, there is no penalty for wrong questions. The format of the questions is a multiple choice, multiple answer. When I take exams, I remember the number that I get wrong and I actually count in my head. Like, okay, I'm, I think I got this one wrong. I'm okay. You know what I mean? Um, for the duration, you got 1.5 hours. So that means 1.5 minutes. That's 90 minutes. Uh, your seat time would be 120 minutes. Seat time refers to the amount of time you should allocate, not the time that you're sitting the exam. This includes time to review the instructions, show online proctor your workspace, read and accept NDA, complete the exam, provide feedback at the end. Um, and really check in online is super, super, super stressful because every time I've done it, something's gone wrong. You know what I mean? Like they don't like my card. They make me check the whole room again. There's a lighting issue or I'm taking, I'm trying to take a photo, but it's saying like it's blurry, but it's not. So, you know, just make sure you have ample time there. And uh, uh, even if you do do that, like sometimes they start the exam early just because you're ready. Um, so it might not be exactly the time that you take it, but um, and it's similar to in-person as well. If you sometimes show up early, they'll just say, hey, you can go. Um, and so this exam is valid for three years or 36 months before recertification. I don't think you can sit an exam uh, if you have one active. That's usually the, the thing there. You get two attempts to pass. So if you fail, you get another try by rescheduling a future date. I actually failed my first attempt because when I went in, I just I knew I had two attempts. And so I, I sat it without a single lick of study and I got 74%, which is pretty good to show like how much cloud knowledge carries over. Um, but I, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, you're paying for two, you should take two. So, uh, you know, if you want to, uh, fail it and go sit it, that's totally fine because then you kind of get a sense of like, okay, I need to brush up on some areas that I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, it's up to you, but there you go.